Welcome to an ultralight airplane design video from the ultralight airplane workshop. In this video, we're going to get back to some of the aerodynamic design of the UWS-4 ultralight airplane. I had intended for this video to be part three of the mock-up build of the UWS-4 ultralight airplane, but I've been having a little trouble getting my schedule lined up with my safety person because I want to do a rollover test and I want to have a safety person handy just in case something went wrong. So that's been delayed a little bit. So we're going to get back to some of the aerodynamic design. Now with this video, we're going to start a new chapter in Dan Raymer's book. If you're new to this series and new to the channel, we've been using Dan Raymer's book, Simplified Aircraft Design for Home Builders, to guide us in building this ultralight airplane. Now Dan's book is intended for designing light sport airplane, but we can use it for building these ultralights. We just had to make a few modifications. So this is going to be the start of chapter seven of Dan's book called Analyze It. What we're going to do is go back and do a little more detailed analysis of what we've done previously. So let's get to it. Before I forget about it, I want to give a special thanks, a shout out to all the patrons of the channel on Patreon. We have a lot of fun together. We have hangar flying each month. We send little notes to each other back and forth on Discord. And for this particular video, I want to give a special thanks to Keith because in this video, I'm going to use an airfoil that Keith developed. Keith did a whole lot of work well, over the last year or so exploring various airfoils. And he came up with a great one, and I'm going to use that in this video for our calculations. Now on with the show. Now for those of you who have been following along in this series, this little page here is going to be fairly familiar. As I said before, we're using Dan Raymer's book, Simplified Aircraft Design for Home Builders, to help guide us in the design of this ultralight. But I want to make sure you understand that this series of videos that we're doing is not really a substitute for Dan's book. We're only using portions that really apply to our design, to our configuration. Dan's book has a lot about other configurations that might apply to a design that you would want to do. If you might be interested in Dan's book, there's a link down in the description of this video that will take you to a page on the Ultralight Airplane Design website. And on that page, there's uh, several books that I'm interested in that I like. And there'll be links from those to Amazon where you can buy the books at Amazon. And the Ultralight Airplane Workshop will get a small cut of those sales. Now, since we've had a few videos since the last aerodynamic design video, let's cover a little bit of what we've covered in those previous videos. Now, for the most part, it was aerodynamics. So for example, we came up with the configuration for the wing, configuration for the tail, we figured out what kind of propeller we wanted, specifically the diameter of the propeller. We talked about the RPM, we talked about the engine horsepower, and we did some work on fuselage design. Then we covered something in Dan's book called stuffing, which is kind of everything else. So it'd be like landing gear, the engine itself, where to place it, uh, the structure of the airplane, and fuel tank placement. And in addition, we did safety. So we looked at how to deal with absorbing energy using crush area on an airframe. We talked about seatbelt design. We talked about adding a parachute to the airplane. Now parachutes wasn't something that Dan covered, but I thought it'd be appropriate for this particular airplane. And Dan talked about how to do drawing for your airplane. And I showed an alternative method using open VSP. Now there's a whole lot of details in all those videos that we did, but this is kind of a brief overview of what we've covered. So the next chapter in Dan's book that we're going to cover is called Analyze It. So we're basically going back and doing a more precise, a more detailed analysis, a summary analysis we've done previously. Previously, we took some wild guesses. We did some really rough estimations to try to come up with the initial design. Well, now we're going back and refine some of those analysis. So in this video, there's three things that we're going to work on calculating. The first one is going to be parasitic drag. So that's drag due to friction on skin. It could be interference drag, just about any kind of drag that isn't lift drag. And then the next thing we're gonna do is a calculation on lift drag. Now, the reason we need these, we're not gonna use them in this video, but the reason we need them is for some future calculations. For example, we want to know what speed our minimum drag is. We might wanna be able to calculate what the maximum level cruise speed is. And we definitely want that for ultralights in the United States because we can't go over 55 knots. It'll help us do a better estimate then of how much horsepower we need for our cruise speed. 
and then we're also going to calculate the maximum lift coefficient and we want that to calculate what our stall speed is because we really need that also here in the US for ultralights because we can't stall at a speed higher than 24 knots. Now if you're following along Dan's book we're going to start on page 87. Now hopefully this symbol here is somewhat familiar to you. We've talked about it in previous videos. This is the coefficient of parasitic drag. So we're going to calculate that. Now there are several parts of the parasitic drag. The first one we're going to calculate is basically the friction drag. Now there's a couple others we'll calculate and add those in, but let's do the friction drag first. So this is the equation for doing it. There's a coefficient of friction drag that we need to come up with. Now Dan has a nice table to help do that. Then we need to know what the surface area, the wetted surface area of the airplane is, and then the surface reference area. Now using Dan's table, which is on page 87, we look at the column for single engine airplane, because we only have one engine, and we're going to use the row for average metal design. Since this is mostly a metal design, although there will probably be some fabric and some composite, but mostly it's a metal design. And that comes out to be 0 0.0058. So that's that going to be C sub FE. Now the reference area is something that we figured out way back in the part four video on the wing configuration. If you haven't seen that video yet and you'd like to take a look at it, I'll put a link up here in the upper right hand corner for you. And you click on that and it'll take you back to that video. And then you can come back here. Now the result for the reference surface area that we came up with in that video was 121 square feet. So the only thing left in this equation we need to figure out is the wetted surface area. Now the wetted surface area would be the external area that would get wet if you dunk the airplane in a tub of water. So that does not include internal area like ribs and spars and the inside of the skin. It's all external that would get wet if the airplane was watertight and you dunked it into the water. Now there are a lot of ways to estimate that area. I'm going to cheat a little bit. Since we put the UWS-4 in OpenVSP, we can actually have OpenVSP calculate it for us. So let's do that real quick. So here we have the latest version of the UWS-4. To make it a little bit easier to come back and redo this wetted area if I need to, for example, I make some changes, I've set up a set in OpenVSP, and that set is all the components of the airplane that way make up the wetted surface of the airplane. So what I can do, and what I did in order to show this to you, I came up here under sets, and I select wetted clean. Now wetted clean does not have the landing gear or the propeller, or any of the other unclean surfaces. And the reason for that is the unclean surfaces, which are example landing gear and such, will calculate separately. So in order to do the wetted surface area calculation, we come up underneath the analysis menu, we come down to Comp Geom. For the normal set, we come down and we select our wetted clean. We ignore the DGEN set. We're going to remove subsurfaces and we're going to say Execute. Now it came up with a mesh that it used to do the calculation. So that is all the wetted surface area. So you can see down in this area, it actually removed part of the wing. Since it's inside the fuselage, you wouldn't count that as part of the wetted area. And same for the booms over in here. There are some of the boom that's inside the wing, but it removed that since it's not going to be wetted. Now we can come down in here and look at our result. Look at this column called wet area. And down here we have 421 square feet. So that's what I've got here. So we plug this into the calculation and our coefficient of drag comes out to be 0 0.020 roughly. So that's the first part of our calculation done. It was pretty easy, particularly since we used OpenVSP for our configuration. Now we're going to do the drag for our unclean parts. So that would be like landing gear, and in this case, the windshield. So on the next page in Dan's book, page 87, he has a nice table for helping to calculate the drag for the unclean parts. Now for our case, the only two that really apply are the exposed wheel and tire, and then the windshield sharp edge. Now, the way Dan has us set up is you take the value from the table, for example, on the exposed wheel and tire, he has a value in there of 0.25, and then calculate for the exposed area, the frontal exposed area of that item. Now again, OpenVSP comes to the rescue. 
So let's figure out what that frontal area is going to be for our landing gear. So let's bring up OpenVSP again. Just for grins, I thought I'd show you what I've got in OpenVSP, the entirety of everything that I've added, and you can see it's a pretty jumbled mess. So we had the various planes that I put in here, the ground plane, the 15 degree landing plane, the various sight lines from the pilot, the various rollover angles, the windshield, which is this blue thing here, the pilot, all the structure, the harness for the parachute, the parachute itself, I put everything here just so you can see what it looks like when everything's turned on and visible at the same time. It's quite a mess. So I only look at it a little bit at a time. So what I want to do now is get rid of everything but the landing gear. So let me show you that. So here we have just the landing gear. So the two main landing gear. I don't have an axle or a hub here, but that's okay for calculating frontal area. And of course, here's the rear landing gear, one on each boom. So we want to do a calculation of what the area is, the 2D area, two-dimensional area, when we're looking at it for the front. Now we don't actually have to look at it from the front, although let's go ahead and do that. So here's what it looks like from the front when we were in the cruise attitude. Now to do our analysis, again we come up underneath the analysis menu. We do projected area. Let me make that a little bit bigger. Now in this case I don't have the landing gear as a separate set so I'm just going to do the set shown because this is the only thing showing right now. We don't need a boundary. I'm not going to do a vector. What I'm going to tell it to do is look from the X direction. Now X is the front to back direction. So you can see the little yellow button here is turned on so we're looking from the X direction and we just tell it to start. So we have 1.79 square feet for the frontal area here. So that's what I've entered here for the frontal area of the exposed wheel and tires. So now in order to get the ratio of drag over Q, don't forget that Q is dynamic pressure. For that ratio then, we take this 0.25 that we got from Dan's table, multiply by the frontal area, and we get our D over Q, which is almost half a square foot. Now in order to get the coefficient of drag from this, we take this D over Q value, we divide by our reference area, that surface reference area, so that gives us our coefficient of drag for the landing gear. And so we do that here, we come up with 0 0.0037. So what we'll do is we'll add that to the previous coefficient of parasitic drag that we calculated. Now the only other thing in Dan's table that applies to us is the windshield. I decided to go with sharp instead of smooth. We're not open, we have a closed cockpit, but it's possible that I won't have smooth edges on the windshield. I actually haven't designed that yet. So let's just assume a worst case. Now the value from Dan's table for that is 0.15. Now I did the same thing again for the windshield. Let me show you that real quick. Now this is just an approximation. What I did is I brought up my fuselage and I used something called a conformal and I had it extend just a little bit outside of the fuselage, roughly where I think the windshield's gonna be. And that's this blue area. So now I have the windshield itself. Now there's a, just a little bit more here than I want. This area down in here should not be included in the calculation. I decided to leave it in there though because this isn't quite the correct area that I want for the windshield. It really should come back down here a little bit more. And so looking at it from the front, there would be just a little bit more down in here that would be exposed and should be calculated. So I'm going to assume that they're roughly equivalent. So I decided to go ahead and leave it in here. So again, we're gonna do that frontal calculation like we did for the landing gear. Come up under analysis, projected area. We're gonna do what's shown. We're doing it in the X direction and we start. So in this case, we got uh, 3.58 for the square feet. So we do the same calculation again. Our 3.58, multiply it by the value from Dan's table, 0.15. And we get oh, a little over half a square foot. And again, dividing by the reference area, we get uh, 0 0.00444, so we add that again to our coefficient of drag we had before. So if we add all three of these up, we get our parasitic drag total, so that's 0 0.0283. Now, as I said before, we'll use this in a later video to do some calculations. Back in the video for part two, we did an estimate for this coefficient of parasitic drag also. In that case, it was a much simpler estimate what we did is we used, let me go back here. 
what we use is the estimate for this ratio. We didn't really know at that point what the wetted area was or what the surface reference area was, but we knew what the ratio was for conventionally configured airplanes were, at least smaller airplanes. And that value was 3.8. And that's what we used on this equation to calculate our coefficient of drag, parasitic drag. I calculated what that ratio is for the UWS-4, and that was 3.47. So it was a significantly lower than for the conventional configuration that we use for the part two estimate. And as a result, you can see here was the part two coefficient of drag estimate, 0 0.0342. Now compare that to the value we just calculated using a little more detail and we're quite a bit lower, 0 0.028. So we calculated a much lower parasitic drag coefficient. I think that makes sense, at least considering how we did that first estimate, which is for a conventional configuration for small airplanes. Now, if you take into account that number probably covers a broad range of small airplanes, including slow flying and fast flying, then think about what that value would be for a fast flying airplane. For a faster flying airplane, I think that ratio is gonna be higher. You're gonna have a smaller reference area because your wing's gonna be smaller, but just about everything else on the airplane is gonna be roughly the same size. So that means that ratio should climb a little bit. So if you include slow airplanes, which should have a fairly low ratio of wetted to reference, and the faster airplanes that will have a higher wetted to reference, then I think that average for the conventional configuration, low speeds and high speeds, it's gonna be higher than it would be for an ultralight. So although this difference here is pretty big, it's probably not completely out of line. No, I really was expecting this coefficient of drag to be a little bit higher. I was thinking probably a little closer to 0 0.03 instead of 0 0.028, maybe just a little bit more than 0 0.03. But for now, we're going to go ahead and go with it. Now, the next thing Dan talks about is doing the drag due to lift of the wing. Anytime the wing is providing lift, it's also creating drag. Now that is drag that you have that is in addition to the drag that you would have at zero lift. So the drag due to lift, the, at least the symbol that Dan's using for that is K, and the equation for calculating that is one over pi times the aspect ratio times an efficiency factor. Now from the part two video that we did, and by the way, if you haven't seen part two of this aerodynamic analysis series for the UWS-4 ultralight, I'll put a link up here in the upper right hand corner that'll take you to the part two video. And you can take a look at that and then come back here. But from that video, we came up with an aspect ratio for our airplane of 4.5. Now the aspect ratio for this design may not stay at 4.5. The reason we chose 4.5 is to try to make the wing as light as possible. The lower the aspect ratios, generally, the lighter we can make our wing. And we're really gonna need to save as much weight as we can on this airplane. But if we had some pounds left over available in our margin, now remember, the empty weight of the airplane can't be more than 254 pounds, at least here in the United States. If it came out to be 250 pounds and we had another extra four pounds of margin there, we might redesign the wing to increase that aspect ratio a little bit to get up to that 254 pounds. But the reason we would want to increase that aspect ratio, we'd get a little bit less drag, as you can see from this equation. The higher the aspect ratio is, the lower this K value is gonna be. So Dan says that the efficiency factor to use for a typical sport plane is gonna be about 0.75. Now, if you have an extremely efficient wing, let's say if you had an elliptical wing, you could probably have a much better efficiency. Now we have a rectangular wing, so we're not gonna have very good efficiency. I decided on the rectangular wing just because it'd make the build faster. I'd only have to have one or maybe two rib templates so I could pump out those ribs pretty fast. If you have a tapered wing where you can get a slightly better efficiency, you'd have to have a rib template for every rib because every rib's gonna be a different size. Now Dan gives you a couple of modifiers to add in here. Now Dan says if you have a winglet, a properly designed winglet, you can actually multiply your aspect ratio by 1.2. What you're effectively doing is you're creating a better aspect ratio for the wing. Now we don't have winglets, but we do have a little wing extension that's almost like a winglet. It's tapered, it comes out a little bit farther, it extends the wing a little bit. 
So it should increase our effective aspect ratio a little bit. So instead of adding a 0.2, I'm going to assume it's about a 0.05. So we're going to have an aspect ratio multiplier of 1.05 to increase our effective aspect ratio just a little bit. Now that's just a guess on my part. But I think it's probably a reasonable guess. Now Dan also says if you have a rectangular wing, you pay a little penalty of 6%. Now in that case, instead of multiplying it by the aspect ratio, he says you multiply it by K. So that's what we'll do there. So we're gonna multiply K by 0 0.06, and that increases our drag. So if we plug all that in here, we get a K of 0 0.09526. And again, we'll use this value in another video. Since we compare the coefficient of parasitic drag to the value we come up with in the part two video, let's do it for the induced drag also. So as you can see here from part two, we came up with a K of 0 0.09436. So that was actually just a little bit better than what we just calculated. Now that's primarily because we have a rectangular wing. And so we have that penalty of 6%. But our first estimate is not too far from the estimate we just came up with. Well, now we come to the one that I enjoy the most, which is calculating the maximum coefficient of the wing. Now we're going to do it in two parts. We're going to calculate the maximum coefficient with flaps down, with flaps deployed, and without the flaps. But first we're going to do it without the flaps. Now Dan has an equation here to try to do an estimate of what that maximum value is. Calculating the maximum value is very difficult, but you can come up with some approximations and that's what Dan did here. So you take the maximum coefficient of the airfoil itself, so that would be a 2D maximum lift coefficient, you multiply it by 0.9, and that's because your maximum lift of the wing is gonna be about 90% of the maximum lift of the airfoil itself. And then he says if you have some sweep, you multiply by the cosine of that sweep. Now we don't have any sweep, we have a straight wing, so we don't have to worry about that, that'll be one. Now the maximum lift we have for the airfoil we're gonna use is 0 0.709. Now the airfoil we're gonna use is one of the airfoils that Keith, one of our patrons, came up with. And by the way, thank you, Keith. It's a fantastic airfoil. Let's take a quick look at that airfoil. Now here we're looking at a program called XFLR5, and we're looking at the two airfoils, the one previously that I had intended to use, and then Keith's airfoil. So the, my airfoil is in red, Keith's is in blue. So you can see really two significant differences between these airfoils. One is back here toward the trailing edge. My airfoil had a cusp back here to try to increase lift a little bit. Now the problem is I'm thinking of doing fabric covering on the control surfaces for this wing. Now the cusp back here on the trailing edge would be a little bit annoying to do in fabric. I wouldn't get a smooth fabric covering across the span of the ailerons or the flaps. It would bulge a little bit out here in between the ribs. But you can see on Keith's airfoil, it's flat or just slightly convex out here. That's pretty much flat on top and slightly convex on the bottom. So that'll make fabric covering really easy. So I like that a lot. The other difference is very, very interesting. Up here on the front, you can see that Keith's airfoil has this bulge up here. Now, if I remember correctly, one of the parts of the process that Keith used to come up with this airfoil is that he used an optimization program where he would give it the desired various characteristics of the airfoil, which would be like lift, drag, coefficient of moment, and a few other items. And it kept coming up with this optimization of having this bulge up here near the leading edge. Now this one isn't quite as pronounced as some of them that the optimization program came up with, but you can see it's definitely still here. Now you would expect that this kind of shape up here would tend to cause just a little more drag, and it does, but not much. I'm really surprised at how low the drag is on this airfoil, especially compared to mine where I was really concentrating quite a bit on drag reduction. And then speaking of the various characteristics of these airfoils, let's look at some of the analysis. So I've done an analysis using XFLR5, and we'll look at the various polars for these two airfoils. So let's start with the drag versus coefficient lift. Unfortunately, at the moment, I don't know why my axes don't have numbers on them, but that's not really important. You can look up here in the upper right-hand corner and we can look at what the various are. So X would be the coefficient drag and Y will be the coefficient lift. So we'll take a look at those. 
I did these calculations at the stall Reynolds numbers. So let's go ahead and take a look at the drag here. At our cruise attitude, we're about a five degrees angle of attack, and we want a coefficient left of roughly 0 0.5, 0 0.6, around in there. So let's look at that area. So if we look at our Y of 0 0.6, 0 0.5, let's pick five and a half. So that'd be right here. So there's our coordinates. Let me zoom in here. So there's five and a half. So there's very little difference between these two airfoils. Mine is the red one, Keese is the blue one. So Keese has just slightly more drag, which you would expect just by the visual inspection of the airfoil. But it's not bad, especially when we consider some other aspects. Oh, by the way, let's quickly look at what you expect from climb. So climb would be, oh, let's say up about one or so. So there's a Y of 0.95. So there's more of a drag difference in climb, but I don't really care about that. That's fine. Well, now let's go look at the coefficient lift. So here's the coefficient lift of the two airfoils. So as you can see, Keith, the blue one here, is just a little bit higher maximum coefficient lift. And as you increase the Reynolds numbers, I've noticed that Keith does even better. So that's great. It has a fairly smooth roll off when it stalls, so it's not going to be a sudden really sharp break. So that's good. And interestingly, it has a stall at a higher angle of attack. Now for the 2D airfoil, that's up around, what is that, about 18 degrees. Whereas my airfoil is down around about 16 degrees. Now you'll notice that the line for my airfoil coming down here where it's gonna cross at any particular angle is a little bit higher than Keith's airfoil. So let's say for a cruise, we need a coefficient lift of 0.5. So if we come up here to 0.5, the angle for, at least in two dimensions, for my airfoil is around, oh, one and a half. So for Keese, we'd actually have to increase the angle of tack a little bit up to about two, maybe two and a half. So that's not too bad, about a degree difference. Now let's look at the next thing, which I think is the most compelling thing about Keese airfoil. So here's the coefficient of moment for the various airfoils at various angles of attack. So as you can see, for just about every angle of attack, the coefficient of moment for Keith's airfoil, this blue line, is way, way less than my airfoil. Now remember, the coefficient of moment for a wing causes the nose to pitch down, so the tail has to push down to counter that. Well, that's extra weight then that the wing has to carry. That's called trim drag because, as I said before earlier in this video, the more weight, the more lift you're demanding that your wing create, the higher your induced drag is. So the less weight that we have to push down with the tail because of Keith's airfoil, that means we have less induced drag. Now you'll remember his airfoil had a higher parasitic drag, that first graph that we looked at. So it's very possible, I haven't done the calculations, but it's very possible that this lower coefficient of moment will cancel out that induced drag. And since Keith's airfoil gets a higher coefficient lift, not a lot, but a little bit, that means his airfoil is superior to my airfoil. So I'm really liking it a lot. Now I'm not making the coordinates for Keith's airfoil public. It's his airfoil. He'll have to decide what he wants to do with it. It's possible that we'll fold it into the UWS family of airfoils. In that case, we'll come up with a name for it and we'll make it public at some point. But that's up to Keith. Now let's get back to Dan's book calculating the maximum coefficient of lift for the wing. So for Keith's airfoil, maximum coefficient of lift in two dimensions was 1.709. And that's at a Reynolds number of 1.33. So that's a 24 knot stall speed and a cord of, I believe it's 5.1 feet, if I remember correctly, and a thickness of 18% for his airfoil. So if we plug it into this equation up here, all these values, we come up with a coefficient lift for the wing, not the two-dimensional coefficient, but for the entire wing, of 1.538. Now we're not done yet, we haven't deployed our flaps. So when we deploy our flaps, we have to do a little modification. Now Dan has a nice picture in his book of showing how you calculate a area for the flapped portion of the wing. I didn't want to duplicate that here in this slide, it's Dan's photo, so if you want to look at it, you'll have to get his book. But I can give you a verbal description. So let's talk about the equation that we now use to get the maximum coefficient of lift of the wing with the flaps deployed. 
So here's the equation. Again, we're not going to do anything with sweep. So this coefficient of sweep just is a one. Basically, you can ignore that part. So now we use the value we just calculated, which is the clean maximum coefficient lift of the wing. And then we add in a change in lift of the portion of the wing where the flaps are deployed. So an additional lift due to those flaps. You multiply that by 0.9. By the way, you'll notice this is a small L. So we're talking about the change in lift due to the two-dimensional airfoil, not the wing, but the airfoil itself. So we do the 0.9 just like we did before because we're assuming the maximum coefficient of the wing in that area is going to be 90% of what the airfoil's maximum coefficient lift is. I guess I really didn't mention that before. When you see a big L, it means the entire wing. When you see a small L, it means the airfoil itself. Now, back to what we were talking about here. So we take the surface area of the flapped portion of the wing and divide by our reference surface area. So that surface area is the cord multiplied by the span of the wing that has flaps on it. That's all that is. So let's figure out what these numbers in and plug them in and do the calculation. So again, the clean maximum coefficient lift of the wing, we just calculated that. Now Dan has a recommendation to use for the delta coefficient lift change. And he recommends using 0.9 for plane flaps. Now we're using plane flaps on this wing, which means it has a very simple hinge somewhere within the depth of the wing. And so the plane flap just hinges straight down, nothing fancy. So it's not a slotted flap, and it's not a Fowler flap, and it's not a split flap. So 0.9 is what Dan uses for that delta C. Now I did a calculation that the span of my flaps is 14.7 feet, and again I used open VSP to do that calculation. Our cord is 5.18 feet, so you multiply those two together, we get 74 feet of flapped wing area. And again, our surface reference area is 121 square feet. So we plug all that in and we get a wing lift with the flaps deployed of 2.04. So in, I think it's the second video from now, we will use this maximum coefficient of the wing with flaps deployed to calculate the stall speed of the airplane. So here's a quick summary. I generally put these summaries in to help me when I go back to look at some of these values, I forgot what they were and I want to remind myself of what they are. I don't have to search through the whole video. I come back here to the end of the video and I'll find the values. Well, we just talked about them, so I won't go over them again. But let's talk about what's in the next video. Next video, same chapter, but it's going to be another section in that chapter and we're going to do some propulsion calculations. Now, early on, we did a horsepower calculation. We did a calculation for the propellers. We're going to go back and redo that with some better numbers, some better estimates. So that next video is the next one on aerodynamic design. I hope the actual next video to come out will be part three of the mock-up of the fuselage of the UWS-4. We will see. I got a schedule with my safety person to be there at the same time. So hopefully I can get that done within the next few days. Okay, guys, thanks for watching. Until next time.